like to make mention, please, of choir practice and Treasure Seekers Bible Club at 5 p.m. this afternoon. And I'll be having the choir practice again since Brother Brantley will be gone. And I trust that you'll be here on time. In fact, no, don't, I always say, don't be here on time, be here early. That way we can get started on time. I appreciate the work the choir puts in and the work that the musicians put in very, very much. Let's turn in our Bibles to Romans, please, chapter number one. And we'll go back to this series that I was bringing to our attention, having to do with the incarnation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the entirety of the gospel from Romans chapter number one. By way of review, the Bible says in verse number one and following, of Romans 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Notice first the servant, then an apostle, and separated unto the gospel of God. Verse number 2 is a parenthetical verse which he had promised to fore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And we looked at some of the Old Testament Scriptures citing the coming of Messiah. And we go to verse number 3, from verse number 1, the gospel of God concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And so we have both the humanity of Jesus Christ brought to our attention in the phraseology of made of the seed of David according to the flesh however declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now as we think about the phrase Son of Man we find that it is used in different ways in the Bible uh, just by way of illustration, it is found, that phrase alone is found some 191, three times in the Bible. Ninety-three of those times is found in the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, and it is referencing Ezekiel himself. So not every time does the phrase Son of Man apply to Jesus Christ and yet I submit for your consideration that when that phrase, the Son of Man, is applying to Jesus Christ, there is just something automatically understood about it referring to no one other than, and I'll put it this way now, God the Son and the Son of God. It's kind of likewise to be stated that the Son of God or sons of God is not always used every time in the Bible referring to Jesus Christ and yet when it is referring to Jesus Christ there is just something in the context of the language that tells us automatically this is none other than God the Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I said that it's used in other ways. Uh, by way of illustration, we might find that uh, in Job chapter number 2, when uh, the sons of men, the angelic uh, beings, presented themselves to God, is an illustration of it's not being used to God the Son or Jesus Christ our Lord. In Luke chapter number 3 and verse 38, it, that phrase, the Son of, is uh, used in relation to Adam. While it says the Son of God, it in its genealogical reference is going backwards in Luke's Gospel to Adam being then the Son of God. In Exodus chapter number 4, it is used in reference to Israel. Before Pharaoh, Israel, my son. 
again, the thought being Son of God, but not in that unique sense as applying to Jesus Christ our Lord. And then in different ways, it is a different instance, as I should have said, it is used of some of the kings of Israel, and uh, most notably in Second Samuel chapter number 7, and verse number 14, there God says about the son of David, I will be his father and he shall be my son. And it is referring to Solomon. And another way that son of God or sons of God is used is in reference to the saints. For instance, John 1, 11 and 12, he came into his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. But we know automatically there is just something within the text itself. I call it the teaching of the Holy Spirit of God that tells us when that phrase, the Son of God, is referring to none other than Jesus Christ our Lord. It is just automatic. You just know it. I'll use this illustration, although not without flaw, I'll use it anyway. Somebody has said, how do you know when you're in love? The next guy said, well, I don't know, but you just know it. Well, I will say this, that when that phrase, Son of God, is applying to Jesus Christ, there is something holy referenced within the context itself that tells us it is Jesus Christ our Lord God, the only begotten Son of God. While there may be instance, instances of other references, there is that unique sense that Jesus Christ is the Son of God as God the Son. Very unique and very telltale it is in the Bible, I do believe. For instance, one place you can kind of see this is in Acts chapter number 9, which I would like to invite your attention to in the Bible. In Acts chapter number 9, and verse number 20 is where I'll be reading, but this is the chapter that has the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Uh, verse 1, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter. He was on his road to Damascus and he got saved. And after he got saved and learned some things, the Bible interestingly tells us in verse number 20, for time's sake, I'm just going to look at this verse, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. And again, I submit for your consideration that when it's used in this way, we automatically know that it is unique. It is singular. There aren't a plurality in this mode, there is only one, kind of in the vein of Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And here in Acts 9.20, straightway the apostle Paul, still called Saul at that time, he preached Christ in the synagogues, this pivotal doctrinal truth that he is the Son of God. Now by way of review, you may recall, please, that last week I studied a little bit about Matthew chapter number 16, where our Lord said, Whom do men say that I am? And then, Whom do ye say that I am? And I want to restress that ultimately it comes down to an individual decision and relationship with Jesus Christ. There in Matthew 16, verse number 15, is the phrase, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, 
the Son of the living God. And of course John 3.16 tells us, as well as other verses, that this is the only begotten Son of God. Whereby we understand, therefore, that there may be certain instances where a variety might be referred to as the sons of God, including the saints having been born into the family of God via the new birth, John chapter number 3, if I may so cite it. There is that unique sense, that one and only sense, that singular sense of the Son of God referring to none other than Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we likewise looked at Matthew chapter number 26 verses 68 uh, uh, and uh, the beginning verses before that actually uh, down to 61 and through 68 then. But I would like for us to just look at this if we may please in uh, this particular chapter of Matthew 26, Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered, verse 63, and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And again, I hope that you can bear witness with me that this is unique. There is something within the text that we automatically know this is referring to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, it is important for us to grab a hold of that concept to a degree, because after it's all said and done, the Holy Spirit of God is the teacher of the Word of God. You get man's teaching and you get all kinds of opinions, but Ultimately, it is the Spirit of God that discerneth or knoweth the things of God, and it is through the auspices or agency of the Holy Spirit of God that we know some things. And here is one of them. The high priest himself realizes that there is a uniqueness about that phrase, Christ, and the Son of God. And he said, I adjure thee by the living God that you tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Now, verse 64, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, which signifies that what you've just said, what you've just phrased is a confession in itself that I am the Son of God. You're absolutely right, so to speak. I am the Son of God. Jesus always knew who he was. He never was any less than God the Son or the Son of God in the two-way street there. With that in our mind then, there are some other verses that I would like to go to and look at that I think might bring home a little bit more pointedly the thought that we have the uniqueness of the deity of Jesus Christ involved in this phrase, the Son of God. Now it is in that phrase, the Son of Man also. While it refers the Son of Man to different things, it's got a uniqueness about it that we can automatically tell there's more to it in some instances than just to a another, or another human being that might be around such as when it's referring to Ezekiel in the Old Testament. Now in John chapter number 10, I would like to begin my reading in verse number 24. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believed not. Now, again, I bring to your consideration, Jesus is telling the people, I have told you. Why didn't you get it? I've already said it. Now, one of the problems is, is a lot of times people are, people are willfully ignorant. They don't want to believe it. They have another agenda in mind. 
Now here they're telling the Lord, tell us, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? I have told you. And you believe not. Now let me go back to my reading here. I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand, out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now these are wonderful verses talking to us about the salvation that is ours in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Kind of talking from Romans 1 about the gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ, made of the seed of David after the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The entirety about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in these verses we have the wonderful truths that brothers and sisters, if you've put your faith and trust in Christ, if you've received the Lord into your heart as your Savior. There's a lot of different ways I can put it. If you've had the forgiveness of sin via the shed blood of the Lord, if you have had your sins atoned for, if you've been redeemed off of the slave market of sin, if you've been saved, if you've been born again, Man, you're one of the Lord's sheep. Think of that for just a minute. You're not just anybody. You are a child of God. What a wonderful truth that is to it. Now, not everybody is a child of God. It is only those who have come unto the Father by Jesus Christ our Lord. And again, I cite in 14.6 of John, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In other words, if you don't go through the salvation of the Son of God provided for you at Calvary's cross... You're not going to go to heaven. Amen. Your destiny is hell. But don't get too discouraged just yet. Since you're still breathing, you've still got a chance to get saved if you're not saved. You've still got a chance to give your heart to the Lord. You've still got a chance to go to Him on your knees, as it were, and say, Oh God, I know I'm a sinner. I pray Thee, forgive me of my sin. I have my faith and trust in You. I ask You to come into my heart and save me. I'll put it this way, there's hope for you if you're still breathing. Because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, God wants you to be saved. He's not making a great puzzle out of it. This thing wasn't done in a corner. I mean, it was done out in the open and in plain language. You can get saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love it. I don't know about you. I love it when somebody testifies to me about Jesus Christ. I love it when somebody witnesses to me. There have been a few times in my life when I have had somebody witness to me. And I've stood there and I've listened to them talk to me about my need of the Lord and how that the Lord died on the cross for my sin and how that if I would put my faith in Him and believe that God hath raised Him from the dead and call upon Him confession with the mouth, it would be unto salvation. And I've stood there and I've just rejoiced as the the guy tried to get me saved. You know why? Because it's a joyful thing to be saved and to have somebody tell you about how to get saved. I find, generally speaking, when people get mad at me for telling them how to be saved, they need to get saved. 
Because if you've really gotten down and taken a good gulp of the water of life, it's a cause of rejoicing inside of your heart. And man, you're glad for him to tell you about it. I've never had anybody tell me too much about the Lord. I got to tell you the truth. I hadn't had very many people tell me about the Lord, period. We're in a Christian country, so to speak, and I've had very few people ever come up to me and tell me about the Lord. But I'll tell you, I love it when they do. Now, I've had some false prophets come up to me, and i got to admit I don't rejoice in their teaching. I try to arm myself to give the truth of Jesus Christ. And this may be hard for you guys to believe, but I do try to speak the truth in love. Although I must admit I have to work at it sometimes. I don't mind admitting it to this crowd because I got a feeling that most of you are just about like me. But I tell you, it's a wonderful thing we're reading about here in John chapter number 10. And dear me, I've taken my time up on talking about the wonder of the salvation. Well now, listen, you've never wasted time when you've talked about the wonder of salvation, I'll say that. Now let me go ahead here a little bit more. Now he said, I and my Father are one. Uh, keep in mind the overall thing in here is the deity of Jesus Christ and God the Son and the Son of God. And he said, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? What are you stoning me for? The Jews answered him, saying, For good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Amen. They knew what Jesus meant. Boy, I mean, he was, they were cut to the heart by the sword of the Spirit. And remember, that sword is the word of God. That's why I'm telling you there's sometimes you just know when you read that phrase, that's got God Almighty, the Son of God, God the Son in mind in it. Why are you storing me? Well, not for good work, but because thou being a man, makest thyself God. Now, where they made their mistake was that he was the God-man. He was made of the seed of David after the flesh. But you read Luke chapter number 1 and you'll find the Bible says that holy thing that is in thee shall be called the Son of God. The Annunciation of the Birth of Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we go down here, if I may please just read a little bit further. Jesus answered them, It is not written in your law, said ye are gods. Verse number 35. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works that ye may know, and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him." In case you're interested, the Lord is uh, talking to them here a little bit in, in kind of a ironical sense. He said, you guys tickle me. Uh, the, the Bible uh, speaks about a lot of different gods and even uh, you to a degree. And uh, I hear you're stoning me uh, because I said I am the Son of God. There's something wrong with your reasoning, Jesus is saying to them here. You're not getting the point. You're not differentiating between the human and the divine and that the divine and the human came together when Jesus Christ was born a babe at Bethlehem's manger. Well, from the conception, frankly. Another place I would like for you to turn and look at me, uh, look, at the, look with me in the scripture is in John chapter number 8. And in John chapter number 8, 
I would like to, uh, for time's sake, I'll begin in verse number 54. Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I should be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was dead. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Uh, let me stop there just a minute now. Uh, you guys remember that burning bush incident? And you remember Moses talking to the Lord? Uh, well, the Lord telling Moses, uh, uh, Moses, I want you to go down there and uh, talk to Pharaoh and let my people go. I'm taking my people. And um, Moses had some excuses to make. And one thing Moses had to say was, well, <clears throat> what am I going to tell them when they said, who sent me down here to do this? And and uh, remember that God told him, he said, You tell him, I am hath sent thee. I am that I am. I am. Now, this population in the 21st century may not know what Jesus meant by I am, but I'll guarantee you those guys back then knew what he meant by that phrase. Let's read it. I'm again going to read verse number 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple and going through the midst of them and so passed by. Now why did they pick up stones to cast at him? Well, because, again... <laughs> They are thinking he is a man making himself God. He used that phrase, I am, life inerrant, within himself, not derived life. They're talking to themselves saying, you being a man making yourself God. Well, he was God is the only problem they had. They just would not recognize that he was God Almighty come in the flesh. Now then, for time's sake, I'm going to have to hurry here uh, just a little bit and uh, try to bring this to a close. And to do so, I want to cite two verses in John chapter number 8. Uh, first of all, I'd like uh, for you to go back with me uh, down um, and um, let me read. I'll start verse 20. John chapter 8, verse 20. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews... Will he kill himself because he saith, Whither I go, ye cannot come? They didn't understand what he was talking about. But here, verse 23. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you, That ye shall die in your sins. Now if you don't get anything else this morning... Get this, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now, brothers and sisters, dying in one sin is just simply going to mean they're spending eternity in all hellfire. Now, what I want to call to our attention is that... Um, Jesus is telling me, uh, there's a lot of questions generated by this paragraph. I, I grant you that. In fact, the more I study the Bible, the more questions I get, and the more hope I have of getting to the feet of Jesus Christ and having the great master teacher unfold the truth. And I'll be going, why didn't I see that? It was there all the time. But until then, there are some things I can get, and there's some things you can get. And if you don't get anything else, get this. 
is talking about dying in your sins. And he said, look at it again there in the Bible if you want to. He said, therefore I said, if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Isn't that what he said? Now listen, you guys know that I'm a, a believer in the inspired word of God. And that uh, the word of God is word for word the word of God. I'm a believer in the Bible. I want you to look at that phrase carefully. Therefore I said, if you believe not that I am he. Are you on that phrase? And in your Bible you'll see that word he is what? Italicized. Do you see that? Is that the way it is in your Bible? Now what that means is, is that we have something that was not actually in the um, manuscript, but not erroneously put there because of the structure of the Greek language. And languages are a problematic thing. You, you just got to realize a lot of that. That doesn't mean there's an error in the King James Version of the Bible. But I'm going to read it like this to try to make the point, if I may. I just read where Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And they knew what he meant by that. Now here, earlier than that, he is telling them, I said you die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am. Amen. Ye shall die in your sins. In other words, it's like this. Do you guys realize that it wasn't just anybody dying on the cross of Calvary? There have been no telling how many thousands of crucifixions in our world. But there was only one that counted for the sin of the whole world. And that was Jesus Christ. And you know why he is counted? Because he was the infinite God the Son. I can't explain it all. Can't even get a good start, I think, to myself. But I can get this. Jesus loved me. And Jesus died on the cross for my sins. That is to say, he made salvation available to me. But I have to reach out and take it. He might reach out and take it in different ways. For instance, oh boy, I had too much sermon and not enough time. I wanted to go to Acts chapter number 8. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch? What did he say? Now, here's water. What's hindering me to be baptized? And Philip said unto him, If thou believest. That's what hindrance is. You've got to be saved first. And the Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You see, folks, it's like this. That's how he came to Christ. I remember when I came to Christ, clear as a bell. You, you guys out there, you who know Christ as your Savior, you remember that day when you came to grips with the situation that you were the sinner and Jesus was the Savior and that you were justly under the condemnation of God but that God loved you and died on the cross for your sins? And that you needed to make a decision in your heart, though, to give your heart and life. You needed that. Oh, we can call it repentance. There's so many different ways we can put it. But it boils down to this. He's the Savior. I'm the sinner. Or I tend to simplify it in this way. You provide the sinner. God provided the Savior. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Do you know the Lord is your Savior today? If not, I'd like to invite you to come forward on the invitation get saved today. If you're here and are saved, you may want to just come to the altar and 
thank God you're saved. Man, I tell you, if you've got nothing else to be thankful about, you ought to thank God you're saved. Maybe there's somebody you need to come and pray for today. We're bad about not praying for others. We're bad about accusations and that kind of thing. But we're not long, too long at all on praying for others. Maybe the Lord would lead you to the altar to pray today for love. For those you may not like so much, they need the Lord too. Whatever it is, I know not. Now listen folks, I can preach the word poorly, granted, I agree. But the Holy Spirit of God is the one who's got to do the explaining anyway. And I have confidence in Him. Well, I've brought the word. Now it's time for the invitation. So let's stand and I'm going to pray. After I've prayed, Brother Craig's going to lead us in a hymn of invitation. And then when we sing this hymn of invitation, if God has spoken to your heart and you want to be saved, I'd like for you to meet me down here at the front. I can have a counselor come and show you out of the Bible how to be saved or take a position over at the door to my right. And the Lord speaking to your heart, have someone come and show you out of the Bible how to know Christ as your Savior. Perhaps you just want to come to the altar and pray. If you have something in particular you want me to pray about, come to me personally. God bless you to know and do His will on this invitation. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for the time we've had together.